as I was laying on my air mattress looking up at the early morning sky, I tried to see the tops of the trees, but I could not. With some of them towering over 300 feet high, the coast redwoods literally had their heads in the clouds, but they were all firmly rooted in the ground. I went camping last Sunday and Monday with my kids in the mountains of North Santa, north of Santa Cruz. I say my kids, you know, they're in their, <laughs> in their 30s. <laughs> but, you know, still my kids. And, uh, and everywhere we were surrounded with these ancient giants. On one hike down a precipitous trail, you could see the evidence of the wonderful durability. You could see the charred trunks from fire in recent years. But the elements that they endure seem to just add to their strength. For these trees survive and they continue to thrive for hundreds of years. I stood speechless at the sight of one grove, an ethereal glen of old growth trees reaching upwards to the sky, the new leaves, tiny little leaves, needles, um, on their occasional branches catching the sunlight, they made a, a glow that was bright green against the darkness of the woods. There were a variety of ferns covering the forest floor, and, and I really, truly felt a, a soft reverence that surpassed any cathedral or church I've ever been in. These amazing trees are creations that give continual glory to their creator. David says in Psalm 1 that we can be just as strong and constant as the mighty redwoods. When our roots go down deep into God, his ways, his word, his life, we become a towering testament to his power and goodness. No fire of controversy, no diseased attack of prejudice or jealousy, no gale or tempest of trouble can bring us down when we find our hope and derive our life from God. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Particularly, I guess I'm supposed to put them on when I want to look at you, right? I, I'm kind of new with them, so. Particularly, I want to address the men, the fathers and the husbands, because tomorrow's Father's Day, right? Here's what Psalm 1 says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the un ungodly. He shall be like a tree. And if you read the entire psalm, it describes the blessing and security of those who follow God, the righteous, versus those who do not follow God, the wicked. Three things the man of God does not do. He doesn't pay attention to the advice of people who care only for themselves. Doesn't uh, stand in the way, walk in the way of the ungodly. He doesn't saturate his life with this godless culture. Jesus said, in, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. And he doesn't buy into the skepticism of this world, which doubts everything about the Bible and Christ. The man of God is, though, a believer in the word of God, the revealed will and testament of God's providence, his power and his presence in this world. He believes in the historic truth of Jesus Christ as the savior of mankind. Psalm 1 says his delight is in the law of the Lord. We could say his delight is in the Lord himself. The focus of his life is on God, on his wills and on his ways. So the question I want to ask today, particularly of you men, do you want to be that kind of man? Ladies, do you want to be that kind of woman? That kind of husband who finds joy in God? Do you want more than just having the name Christian or Seventh-day Adventist? If you do, God promises he will establish you by making you like a tree. Really. <laughs> the psalm says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You'll be productive, stable, and successful. So what does that mean, like a tree? What does that mean? As I was hiking through the giant redwoods last Monday morning, I started thinking about that and how these trees, these amazing trees, can teach us what it means to be grounded in God. First of all, secure like a tree. That's what it means, secure like a tree. When I think of security, I think of words like safety and shelter and it's established, having roots. There is a desperate need today in this world for men of faith who, who, to not only find security in Christ, but to, as they find that security, to provide security for their families. When you put your confidence in the Lord, he will give you that ability to be the constant, to be the safe person, the safe place, the sanctuary for your family. Jeremiah 17 kind of reiterates what Psalm 1 says. 
Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. A tree is grounded and stabilized by its roots. The redwood can grow to amazing heights, several hundred feet high, actually. And so it, it requires an equally amazing root system to, security, to secure it. It also has the ability to draw water, not just through the roots, but I learned watching a documentary on them that, that it actually absorbs moisture from the fog that comes in from the coast. And uh, it can absorb massive amounts of water every day in the coastal fogs of Northern California. So these redwoods have endured the cycles of drought, storms, fires for centuries. Both David and Jeremiah say, that if you trust in God, he'll give you spiritual roots that will enable you to be a source of safety for your family. You know, the roots of a, of a redwood don't go very deep. They go wide, maybe five, six feet deep, but they can go out as much as 100 feet in any direction from the base of the tree. So men, your children, and your wife need to feel completely safe in your presence, in your home. When they look at you, when they look at you, when they hear you talk and see how you live, they need to be confident in your spiritual confidence. Can you be trusted to give that kind of security to them? Are you providing a sense of grounding to your children? If your life is centered on Christ, you can grow to be as stable and dependable as a redwood. Psalm 128 kind of picks up this idea of paying attention to God's, God's will. Happy are those, it says, who obey the Lord, who live by his commands. Your work will provide for your needs. You will be happy and prosperous. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in your home, and your children will be like young olive trees around your table. Well, you don't have to go get any Lindsay's anymore. You can just pick the olives right there at the table. I mean, you know... This is Hebrew poetry, so they try to find concrete images to convey ideas. We get a little too literal, you know. Can you imagine saying to your wife, you are such a beautiful vine? I don't know if she, she would look at me and say, is that supposed to be a compliment? Just picture your kids as olive trees sitting around the table. What, what the psalmist is really trying to say is, that a home built on the principles and presence of God is a home that's worth being in. It's successful. It's prosperous. It's a safe and happy place to be. How many homes in this world today are like that? And just think what God could do if yours became that way. And then secondly, how are we like trees? Well, God wants us to be strong like a tree. Strong like a tree. When I hear the word strong, of course, I think of muscles, but... And, 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 you know, physical strength. But, but I think of the words perseverance and commitment and integrity. Most of us guys pride ourselves on being strong in one way or another. It's part of the male ego. See the, the father and the son kind of, you know, do a little, uh, I don't, they don't call that a high five. I don't know what they call it, but anyway. They were congratulating each other on being strong. It just didn't, it was a different kind of strength. When we were hiking last Monday, we came to a place where the trail actually split. One part meandered off through the woods. It looked pretty easy. Another part went up this fairly steep outcropping of granite where uh, the Indians used to grind their acorn meal. You could actually see the holes in, in the rock as you walked up. Uh, so we were standing there debating on which way to go, you know. And the one that went up obviously was going to be kind of a tortuous one. It said skyline trail to the sea. And we, weren't, we were looking up. <laughs> so, uh, so my 16-year-old granddaughter, Ayla, said to me with complete sincerity, Grandpa, are you sure you can climb up that hill? Really? Ayla, come on. That did it. I hiked up the granite hill and made it to the top before anyone else. And I stayed at the front of the rest of the group for the next two miles. I was determined to prove my strength, even if it killed me. But the strength that we need as men is not so much physical as it is spiritual. We need a strong faith that will give us endurance in the daily grind of life. 
Colossians 2, 6 and 7 talks about that. Since you have accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, live in union with him. Keep your roots deep in him. I love that. Keep your roots deep into Jesus. It's not just about ideas that float around in our heads. It's about spiritual roots. It's about, about the way we live, live our lives that go deep into Jesus. Build your lives on him and become stronger in your faith as you were taught. And be filled with thanksgiving. I learned that, that redwood trees, some people used to think that when a redwood got to be about four or 500 years old or 180 feet high or whatever, or, I mean 380 feet high, that it, it stopped building mass. And now they know that's not true. Redwoods just keep growing. They just keep growing. And be filled with thanksgiving. I shared with you last week that Diana has more faith than I do. But this week my faith grew. And it was because of Eleanor's prayers. It was because when I got my guitar back, I realized it was, it was that prayer that did it. And I know many other people were praying as well. Uh, and, and when she prayed, first of all, for the thieves to repent, I just, I, it blew me away. You know, my human nature wanted to say, well, let's pray for my guitar. But I don't know if, if the one thief that's in jail now has repented yet. But I do know that Thursday the police returned my guitar to me. So today, I'm full of thanksgiving, not only for the guitar, but for seeing Bob here, for seeing many of you that have gone through some very difficult times in the last few weeks, losing loved ones, here today to, to find support and to celebrate with God's family and God's people. Faith that goes deep into Jesus, building that faith. God wants us to be strong, in Christ, strong like a tree. When we are established in Christ, when our lives are centered on him, he says he'll make us strong. He'll give us strong faith. You need that. If you're a father, if you're a husband, you need strong faith because stuff is going to happen as you live your life. Stuff is going to happen. And when it does, your family's going to look to you to see how you handle trouble and setbacks. That's, that's just the way it works. If, if you uh, lose your job, you're going to exhibit faith. If your kids go astray, will you have faith that God is still with them and he can bring them back? There's a lot of us dealing with that today. If you're faced with sickness or conflict or loss, will you be strong in faith? You will. You will if you're making Christ your confidant and strength every day. Faith is tested. It's developed in the struggle. You know, to have life go on easy and no problems and no, no issues for us here on this earth, that doesn't develop our faith. Our faith is developed when we're on our knees saying, God, help me. I don't have the answers. Being strong like a tree also means living with integrity. The redwoods stand so tall and true, they're unmovable even by violent storms. Everywhere we turn, there are temptations in our world, right? We're tempted to cut corners. We're tempted sexually. We're tempted to run away when things get tough. Living with integrity means we stay true to our calling in Jesus. We don't get distracted. We don't go on detours. Let your eyes, Proverbs 4 says, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. That's what God is, is, is trying to develop in the men of his family, in the leadership of his family, in the fathers and the husbands of his family. Men who have integrity. But the truth is we do get off track, you know. It'd be really s silly and idealistic to say we just, you know, by our own uh, will, we go the right way and do all the right things. We, we do fail. We do falter. Integrity also means we admit our struggles because integrity is about being honest about what's not going right. 
Integrity is being transparent and real about our weaknesses and our character defects. Admitting you're wrong when you're wrong. Admitting you're struggling when you're you up against something you can't figure out. That takes the strength of integrity. And while you're admitting your need, uh, guys, go ahead and ask for help. <laughs> I'll say it again, guys. Ask for help when you need it. <laughs> Because if there's anything men don't like to do, it's to ask for help. One of the first things I learned when I got into counseling, I, not as a counselor, but as a patient, <laughs> was I needed to learn how to ask for what I needed, how to ask for help. During one period in my life, I was going through a very difficult time, but because I thought I could handle it, because I was the one who was supposed to handle it, you know, the pastor should be strong, right? Right? It took me years to admit that my first marriage was failing and I needed help. It took me years to go to a counselor when I should have done it so much sooner. I remember the counselor asking me in one of those first sessions to use feeling words to describe what was going on inside me. I didn't even know what he was talking about. Feeling words? I think, I'd start out, well, I think this, and I, I believe, you know, he'd say, no, I, you know, Okay, here's your assignment, Terry. Go home this next week and write me out uh, 50 feeling words. Or if not, just give me 10. That was a challenge. And I have a college degree. Can you imagine? I was so much in the logical side of my head trying to figure it all out, thinking I could figure it all out that I didn't even know I needed help. Integrity is as much about being honest with yourself as it is about being true to your purpose. God wants to give you strength, not only for you, but for your family. Perseverance that keeps you going for their sakes. Commitment that helps them through even the toughest times. Integrity that provides a, a true north pointer for them to be able to see God. In another way, God wants to make you like a tree like those mighty redwoods, is he wants you to be soaring like a tree. Soaring like a tree. When I think of, of, of how high and lofty these, these giant redwoods are, I think of words like vision and purpose, excellence. Currently, the tallest redwood is 379.3 feet high. Now, that could change because they keep growing. If you were able to ascend to the top, as a select few in the world are, you would see sights that no one on the forest floor could possibly see. When the Bible says that the man of God will be like a tree, I think it also means God will give us vision and purpose. How can you lead your family if you don't know where you're going? <laughs> see, God's going to help you with that. Joel 2.28 says, Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So there is hope for us old guys. You know, the old men get to, to, to dream dreams anyway. We still get to have them. Following Jesus doesn't mean you, you, you bury all your dreams, that you lose them all. It just means you get a much better perspective. If I could have scaled any one of those trees that I hiked through this past week, I would have not only seen the crown of the world's tallest forest, and by the way, there's this amazing ecosystem that resides in the very tops of the redwood trees. There's actually a, a, a soil up there in the branches that collects and, and uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, deteriorates, and, and there's, there's huckleberries growing up there. If you, could, if you lived up there, you'd have something to eat. The salamanders, some of which never, ever touch the floor of, of the forest, live in the trees all the time. They have plenty to eat. They eat the uh, termites and the bugs and so forth. But I, I, would, I would have seen that amazing forest, but I also would have been able to see all the way to the ocean, all the way to the sea. So what is the vision that God wants to give you today? What has he already shown you for your life? for your family that you have allowed to become obscured in the daily darkness of life. The Bible also says where there's no vision, the people perish. Are you going to be content to just slog through the routine of your life, grabbing on to vacation time or weekends just to help you survive? <laughs> you and I have no idea, 
no concept the amazing direction and vision that God can give us until we find our center, our strength, our hope in Jesus Christ. I think about John and Kat Schroer in the South Pacific. I didn't know they were going to be here today, but they are. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, you guys are an absolute miracle, absolute miracle. And if you want to know how that works, you talk to them afterwards. They'll share some stories with you. When, when Johnny was a student missionary for the first time, you correct me, John, if this is, if this is uh, wrong, he, he went to Ponape, yes, as a student missionary, but he thought it was going to be kind of like a vacation. He was going to, you know, go fishing and surfing or whatever else. But when he was out there, God gave him a vision to devote his whole life to helping the people of Micronesia. Now that dream, that vision, has carried him and Kat through amazing, through dangerous and gut-wrenching experiences, and it has also helped them, but it has also helped them make an eternal difference in the lives of the people they are called to minister to. So I understand Kat's going to be with us next week to help us with music, right? As we say goodbye to Pastor Kay and Tom. Jeremiah 1.5 says this, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a, a special work. Soaring like a tree also means that God gives us purpose that we never realized. God told Jeremiah he had been set apart for a special work, a particular purpose. Do you know that you have also been chosen? You have been set apart. God has a unique purpose for your life, a unique ministry, one that only you can fulfill because guess what? There's only one of you. <laughs> no one else is built like you. You know, I praise the Lord that the Supreme Court struck down that whole thing about uh, uh, patenting the DNA. Would you like someone to patent your DNA and then you'd have to, to pay them $5,000 every time you wanted to know what was going on inside your body? I don't want that. You know, God made us unique individual. And he has a, a unique purpose for your life. This fall, we're going to spend about eight weeks exploring our God-given purpose. Kind of a, re, a renewed uh, journey through the purpose-driven life. It's called, uh, What on Earth Am I Here For? So make sure you plan to be around at North Hills in the fall. What does God have in mind for you? If you allow him, if you place your life in his care and under his direction, he will reveal it to you. He will reveal it to you. Soaring also means living toward excellence. This is what Solomon has to say. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it how? Do it with all your strength. My grandmother taught me, be the job great or small. Can anybody finish it? Do it well or not at all. Well, in her mind, not doing it at all was never an option. So she might as well just said, be the job great or small, do it, and do it right. She could have preempted Nike's slogan. What is your gift? What is your passion in life? Some of you love to cycle. I know Dr. Demi does, and, and many of the rest of you do. Um, and, and you can leverage that love. Whatever your passion is, you can leverage that love and Binding your kids close to your heart. Obviously, one of my passions is music. When I found my guitar, I started calling people. And the first ones I called were my kids after I called Diana. I called my kids because they we share that passion. And they were so upset about me losing my guitar because they. I, I told them, I know you guys are upset because you won't have anything to fight over when I die. So I called them and said, now you have something to fight about. My youngest daughter, Laura, said, no, Dad, everybody knows. I get it. See, see, what God has given you can be what binds you to your children, to your family. Some of you love to travel or you have the gift of talking to people or entertaining. Maybe the gift of music or baking or making quilts. Whatever you set your mind and hands to do, do it as a project for the king of kings. Don't do it as if nobody cares and it's just a little thing. Don't demean and depreciate the, the talent God has given you. I met my, my son's girlfriend uh, uh, camping, and she just graduated with a nursing 
degree. I couldn't figure out. My son is a, is a musician. He, he doesn't like to be contained in classrooms or small spaces. He, he needs freedom. And he marries a nurse who is very process-oriented, logical. You know, you got this writing things down all the time. How, how did that work? And then I found out she had majored in music and, and had been at the top of her class in opera. Okay, that makes sense now. You know, that makes sense. Oh. And, and I, as I talked to her, I, I said, well, what are you doing with that now that you're a nurse? She said, I don't, I don't really have an outlet. She, she grew up in a Catholic church, and she said when she was younger, they had a band together, and people were coming to their mass more than anybody else's mass because they really had the energy going. You know, that's great. We have a great Sabbath mass here, don't we? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, uh, so I said, what are you doing with it? She said, I don't, I don't know. I said, you, you have to use your gift. Don't let it lie dormant. I said, why don't you go, you know, when you get to the, the nursing uh, uh, job, see if you can, like, get some people together once a week, like I used to do when I was a chaplain. We would, we would walk through the, wall, the halls of the hospital every Tuesday morning for about a half an hour, and we'd just sing old gospel songs. We wouldn't even go in the rooms necessarily. You wouldn't believe the response that people have, how it, it opened their hearts and, and actually facilitated the healing process. And she's like, wow, I think I'm going to try that. <laughs> Use your gift. Use your gift. Do it with all your mind and heart and strength. And that's actually part of what Jesus means when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We show him our love when we take his gifts seriously and we use them excellently for his glory. We show our families our love for God when we don't allow our God-given abilities to languish and atrophy because we don't have time or we're afraid no one will care or I don't know, you can come up with a whole list of excuses. We could spend all of our time talking about excuses. Throw the excuses away. Use what God has given you for his glory and for the binding together of your families. Soar like a tree. See what is unseen. Find your direction and purpose. Put your heart into the life that you're now living. That's God's will for you today. The last way that we are to be like a tree is we are to be sacrificial like a tree. When I think of sacrificial, I think of words like provision, substitute. I was going to say martyrdom, but none of us want that. But, you know, it might come to that. One more way God will make you like a tree. It's not usually the way we want, but it's the way of Christ. He'll make you a living sacrifice. There's no doubt in the nor that in the Northwest, the, the wholesale logging of ancient growth forests that started in the mid-1800s nearly wiped out the redwoods. But the truth is that it, the answer wasn't to completely stop uh, cutting trees down or managing the forest. The truth is to be intelligent about it. And now with advanced management forestry techniques, the, the redwoods have actually begun to come back. They've actually begun to increase. If you, if you get a chance, look up the uh, National Geographic Giant Trees uh, video. If you have Netflix or something, it's just one of the greatest documentaries. It'll really, you know, give you a view of, of these magnificent trees. They didn't pay me to say that or anything. But. Trees are, are good for wood. And wood is good for homes. In order for us to have shelter, trees are going to be sacrificed. In order for your family to, to feel secure, to be strong, to find purpose, you and I have to make sacrifices. We live in a world where we're being told all the time, you can have it all. You can do it all. You can be a good church person. You can be a good Christian. And you can go and, and have fun and do your job. You can do it all. Just don't sleep. That's not true. That's just an absolute lie. You are going to have to make sacrifices. I remember when the phrase quality time first began to be used in our culture in reference to spending time with our families. It was quality time as opposed to quantity time. We're so busy with life, we can only give a little bit of it to our spouses and our kids. So the idea was to pack as much quality into the few minutes we had, and that somehow would make up for the amount we couldn't give. I read at one point that the average father only spent 
15 minutes a week actually talking with his kids. Quality time. You know what that is? It's pure hogwash. And if you want to know what hogwash is, well, you come and I'll tell you. I'll give you another term later. But There is no substitute for quantity time. The quality of your relationship should always be at their best. We should strive for, for having the best quality. But if you don't give your family large chunks of your time, you're going to regret it. Do you think, guys, do you think that at the end of your life, you're going you're to be saying, man, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> or I wish I'd taken on more projects. No, you're going to wish you spent more time with the people you love. The people you love. To the day I die, this song will haunt me. I heard this story years ago. It happened in, I think, 1990. Reba McIntyre, great country singer, had a band. Eight members of her band were killed in a plane crash while they were on tour. And she wrote a song that was put on an album. The whole album pretty much was a memoriam to them. But she wrote this song called, If I Had Only Known. If I had only known it was the last walk in the rain, I'd keep you out for hours in the storm. I would hold your hand like a lifeline to my heart. Underneath the thunder, we'd be warm. If I had only known it was our last walk in the rain. If I had only known, I'd never hear your voice again. I'd memorize each thing you ever said. And on those lonely nights, I could think of them once more. Keep your words alive inside my head. If I had only known, I'd never hear your voice again. You were the treasure in my hand. You were the one who always stood beside me. So unaware, I foolishly believed that you would always be there. But then there came a day and I turned my head and you slipped away. We don't need to live our lives with that kind of regret. We don't need to live running pell-mell, you know, down the road of life, trying to fill our needs and trying to please everything and everybody except the ones that God has given us. We don't need to do that. The Bible tells us that the way to love our spouses and our families is to lay down our lives for them. Husbands. Paul says in Ephesians 5, go all out in your love for your wives exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. If you live day to day with only your own interest, your own agenda, planning and living as if you're the only one, you will one day regret it. Love is not just the best way to live our lives. It's the only lasting way to live our lives. This is my commandment, Jesus said to us. The night before he died on the cross, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I think he would say family. He went on to say, you are my friends. So dads, yes, and moms, and all of you, but dads, be ready and willing to sacrifice anything you have for the sake of your family. They're the most precious thing you could have. No amount of money or prestige or accomplishment or acquisitions can ever compare to the worth of your kids, your wife, your family. Live a life that is rooted and grounded in Christ, that finds its strength and purpose in God's ways, that is spent in sacrificial love for the sake of others. God will make all of us who do that, he will make us like those mighty redwoods, secure, strong, soaring, ready for sacrifice. Trees of righteousness that point to the Lord of glory. Lord, you know that to fulfill this vision and to fulfill this picture, we, we, need, we need change in our lives. And right now, we, we, we ask you to make that change. We want to become what Paul described as just lumps of clay in the hands of a master craftsman who can shape us into whatever vessel he chooses. That is you, Lord. 
you shape us. You remake us. You give us that security and and that strength and that vision and purpose and hearts that are willing to sacrifice so that we too can be called trees of righteousness that are planted by you that will bring eternal glory to your name. Mm -hmm.